You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 185, which I have titled, quite clumsily, Racial Equality Denied and the Betrayal of China. In this episode, we will shift our focus into one specific region that would be discussed at the Paris Peace Conference, the Far East, where the primary players will be Japan and China. This focus on one area will be the format for the next two months or so of the episodes as we move around the globe, looking at how the conference interacted with various areas around the world. Japan and China would be on almost complete opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of international prestige, power, and respect before the conference, but but at the end they would both walk away disappointed. On one side of the spectrum would be Japan, a country that had entered the war near its beginning by jumping in on the side of the Entente. Even before the war, the country had good relations with the British, who believed that a good relationship with Japan was a critical piece in maintaining the British position in the Pacific. In this goal, the Japanese were seen as a partner, and after entering the war, Japan still occupied this position. When it came time to send a delegation to Paris, Japan would be given a seat at the big kid table, I guess you could call it, of the Supreme Council, placed among the most powerful nations in the world. Japan entered the conference full of confidence, thanks in no small part to the treaties, most of them secret, that the country had signed with other victorious countries that contained certain promises and guarantees, which meant that Japan would have a very good chance of accomplishing many of its goals at the conference, especially when it came to territorial acquisitions. On the other side of the spectrum was China. China had a long history of being exploited and looked down upon by the European powers. It, had seen, it was seen as a country from which resources could be extracted, with a government that was too weak to prevent the country from being used and controlled by other countries around the world. It had joined in the war much later, and even though it had tried to be an important contributor to Allied victory, even attempting to send soldiers to the Western Front, the country's role in the war would always be minimized by its allies. While the relationship between the two countries and the European powers was very different, the relationship between the two countries was also not very equal. During the war, the Japanese had forced the Chinese government to sign a document that would be called the 21 Demands. This treaty, which included the requirement that it remain completely secret, gave Japan wide-ranging control over large areas of northeastern China. The existence of this treaty, and the fact that it was signed by the Chinese government, would greatly hinder the efforts of the Chinese delegations at the conference, and the end result would be a treaty that would be seen as a disaster in China. For both of these countries, we will look at their goals at the conference, the delegations that they sent, and then what happened once they arrived. We will then of course discuss the results of the conference, and how those results were received by both countries, and why both countries saw the conference as a failure. We will start today with Japan. Japan had been preparing for the Paris Peace Conference since they had entered the war in 1914, and when it was time they would send their delegation to Paris. 
Overall, the war had been very good for Japan. Japanese manufacturers saw both an increase in foreign orders and the almost removal of many European countries from the Asian economic scene as those countries were forced to focus on European concerns. These economic gains were joined by a huge increase in the German merchant marine, which increased Japan's role in international shipping. This increase was due mostly to a huge increase in demand from China and Russia. Like most countries in Japan, this massive influx of wealth did not benefit all of society equally, but there was enough to go around, and it would not cause any massive problems, at least in 1919. Even with the benefits from the war, the Japanese were still very concerned about their lack of direct control over natural resources. This drove the government to push for the creation of a Japanese empire on the European model, one structured around resource extraction. To this end, the two primary goals for the Japanese delegation at the conference was to gain control of the North Pacific Islands that had been German colonies before the war, and then to gain as much power as possible on the Chinese mainland, and particularly in the Chinese province of Shandong, which had been under German influence before 1914. The third goal of the Japanese delegation was to push for language around racial equality to be added to the League of Nations Charter, which would prove to be a very contentious topic. One thing I want to mention about Japan, and this is a, a big reason why, they, why we will not be discussing the Japanese delegation very much after this episode, is because Japan was one of those countries at the conference, much like Italy, that did not get involved with discussions and decisions that did not directly affect the country itself. This would limit their role in many of the big decisions made by the conference or the Supreme Council about stuff like Western or Eastern Europe or the Middle East or Germany, and this limitation was at least partially self-imposed. They just didn't care, and so often we won't be discussing the Japanese delegation very often. When the Japanese made their territorial demands known to the other countries in the Supreme Council, there was generally some concern, but that concern was very different depending on which territory was being discussed. When it came to Japanese requested territory in mainland China, there was not as much concern, if only due to how many previous agreements had been made with the European powers that generally just reinforced the 21 demands that Japan and China had already signed a treaty about. Obviously, China would have some thoughts on these territories, but let's talk about that here in a bit. Right now, let's look at Japan's request for the Pacific Islands, about which there were very large concerns from the Americans. Generally, Jap Japan's expansionist policies in the Pacific were not meant by m many protests from players within the region, specifically Australia and New Zealand. Not because they liked the idea of Japan gaining a bunch of islands in the Pacific, but because they also wanted a bunch of Germany's Pacific possessions. The Americans, on the other hand, hoped that most of these islands could be given back to Germany, who could then barter them away as payment for reparations, with most of them, of course, going to the largest holder of debt, the United States. When this arrangement proved to be impossible, Wilson instead pushed for them to be included as mandates. Mandates are a complicated topic that we will dig far deeper into when discussing the Middle East next episode, but Wilson would describe the concept like this. Quote, the fundamental idea would be that the world was acting as a trustee through a mandatory and would be in charge of the whole administration of, until the day when the true wishes of the inhabitants could be ascertained. End quote. The concept of mandates would be one of those ideas at the conference that Wilson would push for, many other countries would eventually agree to, and then basically all of those countries that were given a mandate would completely ignore the restrictions placed upon them by the concept. A great example of this would be the Pacific Islands that would be given as mandates to the Japanese, with the understanding that the Japanese could not fortify them or make them into military bases. The Japanese would agree to those restrictions, and then proceed to make the islands into important military bases that would be used in the next war. While gaining more territory was an important goal for the Japanese delegation at the conference, another goal, and one that was very popular among Japanese civilians, was the idea that the League of Nations could be a vehicle for the reduction in the amount of international racial discrimination that was experienced by the Japanese and really most of the non-European world. Many Japanese and Asians as a whole saw this racial discrimination as a kind of badge of shame that was placed upon them by the Europeans. As soon as Wilson pushed forward with discussions about the League, the Japanese delegation began working on getting a clause included that prohibited this discrimination. 
In the League Commission that, set, that was set up to draft the League Covenant, the Japanese had two representatives, and during the process they waited for their chance to add in their racial equality clause. The first attempt to do this would come on February 13th, when they tried to get it added into the clause that addressed religious liberty. This piece of the draft already made it clear that League members should not discriminate against people based on their creed, religion, or belief. The Japanese wanted to add the following amendment, and I quote here, The equality of nations being a basic principle of the League of Nations, the high contracting parties agreed to accord as soon as possible to all alien nationals of state members of the League equal and just treatment in every respect, making no distinction either in law or in fact on account of their race or nationality. End quote. Opposition to this amendment would come from both the British and the Americans. On the British side, there were concerns about what such a statement would do to the British Empire, an empire based on the idea that Europeans were superior. The Australians were also very concerned about what, a statement, uh, what the statement would mean for Australia, with one delegate saying, quote, No government could live a day in Australia if it tampered with white Australia. End quote. On the American side, there was a general understanding among American representatives in Paris that there was strong anti-Japanese feelings among the American public, and especially on the West Coast. Edward House, a close advisor to Wilson, was in fact very happy that the British were against the amendment, because it allowed the Americans to oppose it without taking center stage in that opposition. He would say, quote, It has taken considerable finesse to lift the load from our shoulders and place it upon the British, but happily, it has been done. In the book Paris 1919, Six Months That Changed the World, the authors Margaret Macmillan and Richard Holbrook would say this about the period of, the, of deliberations. Quote, While Wilson was away in the United States, the British did their best to resolve the issue. The French, who had nothing at stake, watched with amusement. I kind of just like this mental picture that, that this paints for me of the British and Americans being all angry while the French just sort of hang out, probably drinking some wine, smiling to themselves. Also, if you want a recommendation for a book to read on the conference, Paris 1919 is definitely that recommendation. It's fantastically detailed and informative while also being very readable, which is an achievement. Anyway, back to the conference. The Japanese proposal would not be resolved in February. And much like everything else, it would not be resolved until April. It would be on the 11th of that month, which was also while the Americans and Wilson were dealing with trying to get the League of Nations to work with the Monroe Doctrine, that the amendment that the Japanese had introduced would officially be voted on. Now, by this point, the Japanese had watered down the language in the amendment to say just, quote, the principle of equality of nations and the treatment of their nationals, end quote. This change in wording did not impact the overall opposition to the amendment. As the commission voted, it became clear that there was widespread support for it. The only real opposition was from the Americans, the British, and the Commonwealth, but the opposition was in the minority, and the vote would find a majority of the votes in favor. Seeing the numbers were against him, Wilson relented. Just kidding. Seeing the numbers were against him, Wilson decided to ignore the vote. He would claim that there was clearly a strong opposition to the amendment, so it should be rejected, even if a majority had been in favor of it. Good old Mr. Making the World Safe for Democracy, ignoring democracy in action. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious. And if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 
at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. This rejection would be the end of Japan's quest to get a racial equality clause built into the League of Nations. In many ways, this rejection would be a turning point in the 20th century Japanese history. The country had just played the game correctly, and had become a member of the global community, supported her allies during the war, and yet at the end, it was still destined to be seen as inferior to the Europeans. This would be a contributing factor for what would happen after the war. Japanese political and military leaders would turn away from cooperation with Western countries, and instead they would push to become stronger through direct control of the Western Pacific. Oddly enough, it was the territory that they had gained from the conference that would make all this possible. Influence over the territory on the Chinese mainland would be an important first step in the creation of the Japanese Empire. In the Pacific, the Japanese also gained valuable footholds that would later become battlefields in the next war. These islands were in the Marianas, the Marshalls, and the Caroline Islands, which should sound very familiar to any person with knowledge of the Pacific theater of World War II. I will end this section of the episode with a quote from the head of the Japanese delegation to Paris, Prince Kimochi Sunochi, which would prove to be quite prophetic. Quote, I'm not worried about any general lack of patriotism, but afraid of where an abundance of patriotism might lead us. While Japan entered into the conference in a position of relative strength, its largest neighbor China was in a very different situation. China was in a pretty rough spot at this point in history. For almost a century, the country had been taken advantage of by the Europeans, with large amounts of economic and territorial control having been taken by those Europeans in the 19th century. Many Chinese hoped that the war would prove to be a good thing for China, giving the country a chance to join the international community of nations, and to this end the Chinese government enthusiastically trying to help the Entente and then the Allies during the conflict. This included sending the Chinese Labor Corps, in which thousands of Chinese laborers were transported to both Western Europe and Russia to provide manual labor for the Allied armies. The Chinese would then join the war in 1917, answering the call of the United States, which asked countries all over the world to join in the war against Germany. For the rest of the war, the Chinese would continue to increase their support for the Allied war effort. This would include attempts to send troops to the Western Front. In these efforts, they were thwarted by the British and the Japanese. The British did not want the Chinese troops on the Western Front due to, you know, good old classical racism, believing that they would not be worth the shipping that it would take to get them there. On the Japanese side, they did not want the Chinese to send troops because they themselves had not sent any troops to Western Europe, and they did not want the Chinese to contribute more to the war than they had. With all of these contributions and attempted contributions, the Chinese hoped that they could gain a better position in the post-war world and in the deliberations at the peace conference. However, these hopes would be crushed. The first reason for this was agreements made by members of the Chinese government and the Japanese during the war. These had started with the 21 demands that had been signed with the Japanese in 1915 and then later reaffirmed in 1918. This was a secret treaty that was signed by Chinese officials at the time, but was so secret that many within the Chinese government in 1918 did not even know about it. The contents gave the Japanese control over Chinese territory in Shantung. The Japanese even had it in writing from the Chinese representative that signed the treaty that the Chinese government, quote, gladly agreed, end quote, to the treaties. 
This compromised one of, if not the main goal of the Chinese at the conference, and that was a reduction of foreign influence within their country. The second main problem for the Chinese at the conference was the divisions within the country itself. When it came time to send a delegation to Paris, the country was divided in two, with the government in the north at Peking and one in the south at Canton, both claiming to be the official government of China. Both of these governments would send delegations to Paris, and while these two delegations would end up agreeing on many topics, they had some important differences. Almost more importantly, the presence of two separate and oppositional Chinese delegations reduced the ability of the Chinese to influence the course of negotiations about China. Both of the Chinese delegations would get some initial support from the United States, with the Americans helping them to get their demands in order and then to present them, but the delegations would never work together in any meaningful way. The biggest reason for this is that they both fundamentally distrusted each other, with both sides believing that the other was working with the Japanese. This prevented any kind of real, unified Chinese front from being pushed forward. This was a big problem, but it was not the biggest problem. That was instead those secret treaties that had been signed with the Japanese. The treaties were problematic just at a basic level, but skilled diplomats may have been able to prepare for them and maybe could have worked around them, or at least had a really good, awesome response prepared. There was just one issue with that plan. Remember how I said the treaties were secret? Well, they were so secret that the Chinese delegations at the conference did not know about them. This is a detail that just blows my mind. The Chinese delegations at the Paris Peace Conference were not informed by the Chinese government that they, were, that they had binding agreements with the Japanese that completely changed the situation with Chinese territory, the control of which was the primary objective of those delegations. This was just a gift to the Chinese, and they would wait for the opportune moment to disclose the existence of the treaties, putting the Chinese delegation in a position where they did not have a great response. All they could really say is that the treaties were not valid, which would not prove to be a very effective defense. The fate of Shantung would first be discussed in the Supreme Council in late January. On the 27th, the Japanese would attempt to bring up Shantung during discussions of Germany's uh, Pacific colonies. There were not any Chinese representatives present at the time, but the Japanese claimed that they were not required because it was an issue strictly concerning Japan and Germany, who had control of the area before the war. The other leaders said that China would need to be involved in any discussion about this territory, and so the topic was tabled for later discussion. This discussion would not occur until April. An important feature of this delay until the month of April was the state of the conference during April. This would be the point in the conference where everybody, and especially the Supreme Council, were very busy, and they were very deep into the discussions trying to finalize all of the details in the treaty, which involved many heated discussions and trying to hash out compromises where neither party actually wanted to compromise. This would also be around the time that the Italians would just straight up walk out of the conference due to disagreements with the other countries, although they would eventually come back. Basically, this was not a great time for the Chinese, if they wanted a well-considered, thoroughly thought out, and nuanced decision about the fate of Shandong. But this would be the situation that they would have to deal with. On the 21st of April, the Japanese would once again push for a settlement on the situation in China, and they would threaten to leave the conference if a decision was not made soon. This forced the hand of the other leaders. Wilson's solution, instead of just giving the territory to the Chinese, was to terminate all of the currently agreed upon spheres of influence in China by European powers, and then to place all of Germany's previous territory under the joint control of the Big Five, so Britain, France, Italy, the United States, and Japan. Wilson would gain some acceptance for the removal of the European spheres of influence, with support for this decision also coming from the Japanese, who knew that the more European interests they could get out of China, the better for them, since it would put them in a better position to take advantage of being so close to China after the war. The Japanese still wanted their control over Shandong, though, and they would eventually get it. The Chinese delegation who were present for many of these discussions and the final decision spoke out against it. They denied the validity of the, the agreements made by China and Japan during the war. They claimed that such a decision would have drastic negative consequences within China, and they appealed to the ideals of the 14 points, but none of it mattered. Wilson and the other leaders would say that their hands were tied, both by the agreements made between China and Japan, and between J Japan and the Allies. 
Wellington Ku, the lead uh, Chinese delegate present at the time, would say that this was a colossal error. It would cause issues in China and perhaps even turn the country away from cooperation with the West. He would end his uh, speech by saying that, quote, It is a question of whether we can guarantee a peace of half a century to the Far East, or if a situation will be created which can lead to war within ten years. But none of his words would matter. While the Allies would hide behind international treaties for their decision, it would prove to be another example of very selective adherence to principles. At the same moment that they were claiming that they simply could not ignore official international treaties signed between the Allies and Japan, Italy was preparing to walk out of the conference because the Americans and British refused to acknowledge the Treaty of London, which the British had signed with the Italians in 1915. But in regards to China, treaties simply could not be ignored, of course. While there were many reasons for the selective adherence, and remember that racism will play a role in all of these decisions, there was also another reason, and in our story here, China will prove to be the first of many sacrifices upon the altar of the League of Nations. Wilson would say, when told by one of his secretaries that world opinion would be in favor of China gaining control over the territory, that, quote, I know that too, but if Italy remains away and Japan goes home, what becomes of the League of Nations? Wilson would provide assurances to the Chinese that the League would prevent any future Japanese aggression against China. That would not go very well at all. The decisions made about Shandong would completely sour the Chinese on the entire conference. In fact, when it came time to sign the treaty, the Chinese would refuse. They would not even attend the ceremony. They had put their faith in the Allies, and especially Wilson and his 14 points, and they had been betrayed. I consider this the second largest betrayal by the Allies at the conference, second only to the betrayal of the Arabs, but that's simply just because the betrayal of the Arabs is just on a different level. Back in Japan, news of what had happened in Paris would send shockwaves through Chinese society, and it would cause people to make decisions that would spiral out into almost 40 years of conflict. One Chinese student, who would just in a few days later be involved in the May 4th movement, would say this about what his experiences were in the days after the information arrived at his university. Quote, When the news of the Paris Peace Conference finally reached us, we were greatly shocked. We at once awoke to the fact that foreign nations were still selfish and militaristic, and that they were all great liars. I remember the night of May the 2nd, and very few of us slept. A group of my friends and I talked almost the whole night. We came to the conclusion that a greater world war would be coming sooner or later, and that this great war would be fought in the East. We had nothing to do with our government, that we all knew very well. And at the same time, we could no longer depend upon the principles of the so-called great leader like Woodrow Wilson. L looking at our people and at the pitiful, ignorant masses, we couldn't help but feel that we must struggle. China would continue to be split into two until after the Second World War, first in civil war, and then by the Japanese, and then once again by civil war. In 1920, the Chinese Communist Party would be formed, under the leadership of many participants of those that had taken part in the May 4th demonstrations. It would contain such names as Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai, and they would go on to change Chinese history. As with many other areas of the world, the Treaty of Versailles would not be the cause of lasting peace in the Far East, but instead it would just be the beginning of a new age of war. There would be a constant friction in the region, civil war in China, then war between China and Japan, and then war between Japan and the world. For the Japanese, the shadow of Versailles would last until 1945. For the Chinese, it would last much longer. I pick on it. 